Sweden covers little more than a quarter of a million square miles of Europe. Its population is 8 million, which means statistically around 34 and one quarter inhabitants to every square mile. A quarter inhabitant is an infant. At 16, he or she acquires the status of a half, and at 20, graduates to a whole. A 75-year-old is already struck off the statistical count. If you're Swedish, you may die late in life, but you have quite a job getting born. A million and a half Swedes live in Stockholm. They enjoy an average income of a thousand pounds a year, and they own 500 telephones and 320 TV sets for every 1,000 persons. It might look as though the average Swede spends half his time ringing up and the other third of it in front of the small screen. Sweden can boast the healthiest children who are the least childlike children in the world, the oldest and the loneliest old folk, and the freest living and unhappiest women you'll ever meet. Sweden, Stockholm. Heaven or hell? This little angel face with her crown of lighted candles. She might be an angel from a Christmas crib. A thousand Lucias seem to step down from a ring of stars on the 12th of December, on the feast of Santa Lucia, patron of light. They go from house to house as fresh as snowdrops, their blue eyes raised to paradise as though eternal joys were about to burst through an opalescent sky. And of course they're singing Santa Lucia. heaven. And in real life, is she a nurse? Does she teach in kindergarten? Is she the daughter of a Protestant pastor, one of those tall, bony men in Bergman films? Or are these angels the kind who change their bed partners every night in the sexier Swedish films? Perhaps we aren't quite so close to heaven after all. But does it matter all that much if sexual customs are different? Or is it only our attitude that changes? It is probably no more heaven than it could be hell. A large section of the world's population is composed of young people, and the problem of sex should be an important part of education. In many countries, the old and young fight out their own solution, usually in a prickly atmosphere of emotional muddle. In Sweden, the sexual education of the young is provided for by the state, with a scientific preparation that leaves nothing to chance. One of the top high schools in Stockholm, a mixed class with pupils aged 14 and 15. This is one of two weekly lessons in sexual education. A schoolgirl asks her teacher, please sir, what type of contraceptive would you advise? A diaphragm is far and away the easiest and safest method. Of course, there are pills, but pills are liable to have a depressive effect on the morale, apart from leading to disturbances in the nervous system and causing various upsets of a physiological nature, swellings in the abdomen, for instance. According to this girl, the boy should be the one to take the precautions when he asks a girl out. It's up to him to see that the girl does not become pregnant. She says, this is the only real security a girl has. The class not only discusses contraception, but the problem of legal abortion. They study from textbooks, which in some countries would land teachers, publishers, and even the school cleaners into a court of law. With the detachment of a naturalist lecturing on the behavior of the butterfly, the teacher traces out the anatomical geography of the genital organs while the children listen dutifully, perhaps a trifle bored. The same boredom they will show when they fall in love, make love, commit suicide, and so on. This little pleasure boat cruises around the offshore islands of Stockholm every Saturday evening. Its passengers are all schoolboys and girls, and they have hired it for pleasure, a sort of lab 
for testing out the sexual theories studied at their desks in the classroom. It's Saturday, and the joy of living, laughing, and playing bursts through these 400 square yards of cruiser. For them, social morality lies like a stone on the bottom of the sea, and with it the crumbling framework of our pointless etiquette, false modesty, taboos, and social inhibitions. Gatan, du finns inte mer Du har försvunnit med hela kvarter Tystnat har leken, tystnat har sången Högt över marken, svävar betongen När jag på moser var allt som förändrat Trampat och skövlat, fördärvat och skändat Skall mellan dessa höga hus en dag Stiga en sång Actually, partners are changed several times on the one trip. Girls often make the most of their first experience with two or three consecutive rounds. When it's all over, our young Eve freezes into silent self-communion. Only her eyes betray the shock of her first experience, and she thinks she is happy. <laughs> Following up sexual instruction in the classroom, the Swedish woman may then go for consultation to the State Institute for Sexual Precautions for advice upon the correct use of contraceptives, pills which schoolgirls may receive free at their school when they turn 15. They have to ask for them, of course. The diaphragm, which a specialized nurse advises after taking the patient's measurements and checking them for size on a plastic uterus. Like our little Eve, they believe that they are happy after the discovery of love, even if all they have known so far is sex. How can you explain to them that love is another thing altogether? The Institute also has a shop on the premises where contraceptives and prescriptions are sold. Above the counter, the large advertisement says, babies, yes, but only when you want them. This might be taken as the golden rule of Swedish civilization. There are contraceptive automats on many of the streets in Stockholm. teacher explained during the lesson, some contraceptive pills often produce secondary effects, such as abnormal swelling in the abdomen. Teddy boys, blouson noir, 
Yesterday they were known as Dragare. Today they're called Knuta. These are the groups of teenage boys who roam the outskirts of Stockholm and other cities. For a girl walking in the streets alone, Knuta almost always spells violence, a beating up, rape in the dirt by two or three or five of the pack. It means lying there dazed with your dress ripped to pieces and every chance of becoming pregnant. The state grants the option of legal abortion in such cases. But the gash in the soul still bleeds and will end up by conditioning the girl's whole life. this young Eve, the very concept of physical love could remain as something warped. One more to add to the statistic of female homosexuality. Perhaps no one will ever know, but those anxious eyes will never express peace and security again. Come on, my dear, bid farewell to your spinsterhood. It's your last night of freedom. Drink up. It's the bride's last chance to relive those green years she's leaving behind. Sing and dance and have fun. The young man who will be leading her from the altar tomorrow is elsewhere, probably meditating on the three or four years of queuing in front of the housing office for 150 square feet of living space. Following the custom, her girlfriends are blindfolding her for a last meeting. It's her first love. The boy she went to one night and said, Come on, Sven, I want you to make a woman of me. Well, now you are a woman and you're about to become a wife, so the least you can say to him is thank you. Don't be shy. Don't worry, you're in safe hands. Your Niels is waiting for you to say, I do. And it's goodbye to that night on the love cruise. There were at least four of the lusty lads and, oh well, does it really matter all that much? It's your heart you're giving him. Daggerfors, a clean little town, nearly 200 miles from Stockholm. A warm welcome as we enter the house of Leif and Ingrid Eriksson. Their story has been in all the papers they are brother and sister, and they're living together because they're in love. They never met as children, but saw each other for the first time only after they were grown up. First a tender friendship, and then came love. It meant serious trouble. They were even arrested on the basis of an old law, but were later cleared of the charge of incest. Ingrid herself tells their story. I was 16 when I met Leif for the first time. We had no particular feeling for each other, other than friendship and affection. Then, gradually, we began to fall in love. Eventually, a child was born. A child which we were forced to have adopted by another family before it even came into the world. Our father saw to everything. We had no say in the matter at all. One day, I went into a clinic, and when it was all over, I came home again, alone. I never saw my child. We did everything we could to rebuild separate lives, but it just wouldn't work. We were too much in love. So we decided to make a fight for it. We set up our own home just like everyone else. We wanted to live together as man and wife, and above all, we wanted children. Now we are waiting for a law to be passed, which will allow us to be married and have a proper family of our own. And in order to live like any other happily married couple, 
We are determined to fight everybody who stands in our way. I shall never again allow anyone to take away a child of mine. Of course, she has no hope of ever seeing her first child. And after all, wouldn't it be unfair to disturb his upbringing when he is already used to the family he believes to be his, a family which has become his own? In Sweden, you can adopt children two or three months before they come into the world. The mother goes to the legal authorities, and the judge appoints a curator, a sort of legal godfather, who must vouch for the moral and financial standing of the adopters. The procedure is strict, for candidates are bound to accept the child before birth, without knowing whether male or female, blonde or dark, healthy or deformed. The curator sees to it that the infant is taken from the mother when she is still semi-conscious from drugs administered during labor and handed over to the adopters shortly after birth. With the scissors, mother and child are separated forever. The mother will never know if she has given birth to a boy or a girl. She will never have the chance to meet her child, because the curator is bound by law never to reveal the name of the adopting parents. television in a free state. In Sweden, as in other countries, television not only entertains, it is also educational. In this program, the good burgers of Stockholm are being given a panel of 17-year-old girls answering questions about sex in general and their own behavior in particular. Eva is saying that the first lessons in sex education should be taught to girls when they are about nine or ten years old. But Pia goes further. As she sees it, a little girl should be educated when she takes her first tottering steps in this direction, usually when she's about five. The third girl is less explicit. She doesn't have much to say at all. Maybe she just doesn't like talking. Pia confesses that she had her very first sexual experiences at six years, or was it five? She can't remember now. It was with little boys at school playing mothers and fathers. It wasn't anything much really, not like Ava, who tells us she gave herself to a boy for the first time at 13. No, she may have been 14, earliest at any rate. She adds that if she had become pregnant, she'd have had a job trying to decide whether to apply for abortion or handing over her baby for adoption as a way out. Traumas? Complexes? Oh, goodness, no, she didn't feel anything at all. You see, she'd only known him a few hours. Well, why did she do it then? Oh, she wouldn't know. She just did. There's always a, I just did. I wouldn't know. You make love because you happen to feel like it. You commit suicide because you happen to feel like it. You shoplift because you happen to feel like doing it in spite of the wad of notes you have in your pocket. And so it goes on and on.
A comfortable, solid, middle-class home. The home of Ulla, only daughter of a comfortable, solid, middle-class family. She is the symbol of the Sweden of the 60s. In his own way, father is, too. Mother is resigned. Ulla is 17, frank, self-determining in every sense of the word, earning her own money as a sales girl in a department store. Ulla is with a boyfriend. In any case, it's of no concern to her that her mother's there, the nice, well-bred lady who goes about things with the utmost tact, terribly anxious not to upset or irritate her little girl. Nor does any of it seem to concern her father. And that's the way it goes. Because the moment Ulla gets fed up with being at home, she'll drag some boyfriend to the town hall and marry him and leave house and home forever. And then sooner or later, the old folks will want to move, not into an elephant's graveyard, but somewhere where they'll have someone to talk to. That's why Mummy puts on her smile and serves coffee to the two little pigeons tucked up in... Hey, that's funny. There is simply nothing to be said. This is the elephant's graveyard. Tired old muscles to brand new rhythms. You have to do something while you're waiting. Wasn't it Methuselah who said, there's not all that much to be said for a long life? The trouble is finding something new to do after you've passed 70. PT to the rhythm of a shake, not a bad idea. Keeps you fit, lengthens your life. <laughs> You, madam, what do you think? Ah, of course, you're waiting for your daughter, so you have to be patient. But you know what young people are. Your daughter is an air hostess, flying all over the world. Today, New York, tomorrow, Tokyo. All the things she has to do. It's not an easy life, you know, and there's so little free time. Well, of course, you want to see her before you die. Once at least. You can never tell how your daughter will have changed in these three long years. Anyway, better not think about it. You go on and have a good time. After all, you have everything you want. You'll see one of these days. The day never comes, and the old lady goes away by herself, silently, with the unopened letters unread. Perhaps from some distant corner of the earth, perhaps not. lady's last journey isn't all that far. She's just popping over from one cemetery to another in a brand new hearse under the first snowfall of the approaching winter. She's alone. Nobody else is there. Only the grave diggers in the snow.
odd country, Sweden. It has every amenity. You see everywhere comfort, civilization, freedom, with the most efficient social service organization in the world. True socialism. The Swedes have all the things other countries are still fighting for. Every year in June, they celebrate with a great display of flag waving, the national glories of a nation which today represents the geographical, social, and political vanguard of the new world order. A world with no frontiers, no prejudices, no lofty pretensions. And yet man cannot live without flags, so he fills in with patriotism. Patriotism of a neutral species, fortunately. The expression to live like a prince has little meaning in Sweden. Sigvart Bernadot, the son of King Gustavus Adolphus, whom we've just seen presenting the flags, works as an industrial designer. With keen attachment to democratic ideals, he has renounced all rights to the throne and devotes his life to designing the blueprints for new armchairs, cupboards, and plumbing accessories. Two-seat bathtubs and showers with a seat in the wall. Sigvart Bernadotte, the son of a reigning monarch, a useful, practical citizen. Freedom of the press is absolute. As though letters to the editor were not enough, the authorities provide this enormous wall panel in a Stockholm square for the use of all citizens to write up anything they wish. Hardly freedom of the press, but certainly liberty of the paintbrush, uh, perhaps. Anyone who wants to can paint up protests or anything else they feel strongly about and are bursting to tell the world. The panel is washable, of course. What the Swedes uh, actually write is difficult to decipher. There is no doubt that this Italian gentleman feels compelled to add to the collection. A traditional slogan you can find on any street wall in Italy. Go ahead, get it off your chest. Only remember that it would never occur to the Swedes to paint anything quite so obvious as that on their walls. Man is a lonely animal. And the Swedish man is often seen alone, sitting together, of course. Public places appear to be meeting places. The fact is that the Latin lover type, with his curly sideburns and stovepipe trousers, is well out in Sweden these days. And his carry-on at bar tables couldn't be more dated. As love play, it offers no temptation at all for any of our little blonde girls. It's time for the underdeveloped countries. Well, women say it's a color that goes with everything. Swedish women agree that colored men are more sincere, more interesting, more primitive, more to the point.
last refuge of the old-style Latin lover with his heavy lines and his exhibitionism, obliged to masquerade as a hippie, trying to fit into the nightclub with its girly orchestra and all those big, beautiful musical instruments on display. He's so out of place and out of date, dancing all alone and with his back to that orchestra. Gone are the devilish cravings of the Latin lover, the Viennese waltzes and the horse-drawn trams. Sex education plays its part also in the cinema, especially when you can go and see red-hot films in the original uncut version. Or you can walk into shops where they sell books, newspapers and photographs, which make a fetching display in the souvenir shops for tourists. these publications are printed in a state authorized press which handles obscene material. seriously interested, from a scholastic point of view, he can pay the modest sum of one krona and visit the sex shop, a sort of national library of pornography. Shelf after shelf stacked with publications in all languages, banned in other countries of the world. The books are designed to appeal to men and women, of course, because in Sweden, sex, like the law, is the same for everyone. The name of the street, should you care to make a note of it, is Birger Jalsgarten and runs through the center of Stockholm. Does it attract visitors? Well, yes, there are quite a lot of visitors of all ages and classes. Stockholm also has a series of pornographic comic books on sale, which run a sort of lottery. The prizes are a bunch of naked girls. In real flesh and blood, unfortunately, we can't tell you our number never turned up. yourself photography studio you come in place an order pay and click click you can make your own porno pictures it's convenient it's legal no bother no police raids no scandal the models are professional and so uninvolved no breach of law and order It isn't so much a question of democracy this time, but economy. The state has made a simple, practical calculation. If this sort of thing were prohibited, they say, underground studios would crop up like mushrooms, and we'd have to pay an army of policemen to enforce the law, which would burden the taxpayer. And we can always find better work for the police, controlling traffic and collecting fines. One minute. 
minute overtime on your parking meter, and this young lady will be on your back with a five pound fine. A shining example to the police force. Now her duties are over for the day, she's putting away her book of tickets and going off home. policeman is off to do another job, a bit of overtime. After work recreation at hourly rates in a photographer's studio. So all this story about the police and the taxpayer, don't you believe it? How about this one, hard at work in her one-piece suit? The bottom bit is tailored by one of Stockholm's smartest fashion houses. What's her job when she isn't posing? Welfare advisor, school teacher, nanny. House in the country, two cars and a motorboat are the signs of easy living on a well-nourished bank account. But a maid, a nicely bred housemaid, is the enviable symbol of solid wealth. There are no more than a score of them in the whole of Sweden. Here's a typical one, young, pretty, smart, and as punctual and reliable as clockwork. All her movements are predictable. Nine thirty, the ritual of breakfast, as sacred in Sweden as in England. Ten twenty, cleaning and dusting with scrupulous efficiency flinging herself into the heavier household chores. 11.30, a romp in the garden with her employer's children, devising exciting new games for them. <laughs> 6 p.m., telephone call from her boyfriend, on her own private telephone, which Milady Maid has in her room, complete with television set. Here she can receive anyone at all, but after work hours, and only twice a week. 7 p.m., time to serve dinner to her master and mistress before a social evening. The maid is the one who is going out with her boyfriend. Well, I'll be off now. Don't forget to keep an eye on the children. Don't worry, he'll be saying. They'll look after them. Isn't that what they're there for? 8 p.m., the master and mistress of the house all dressed up doing the washing up so that the kitchen won't be left in a mess. Anyway, it's the national sport of Swedish married couples with or without a maid. One fifty a.m. Little girl has called for her potty. Total of one hour night work. Overtime is counted up one third more. And efficiently noted down on the domestic services list. So everyone is happy. The parents, the lady maid, and the union. And the little girl. Hey, what's 
What's going on? That's my car. Leave that alone. Stop. And he starts beating up the thief. Well, anything wrong with that? Yes, but there is quite a lot wrong with it, because now you have to answer to the police on a charge of violence. You should know by now that the abusive appropriation of other people's motor cars is not a chargeable offence, and that boys are always taking or borrowing other people's cars for perfectly legitimate, even fun reasons. To make love in, or go out for a spin with their friends. Afterwards, they leave them in the middle of the road, or tip them into the lake with a parking meter or two, which they've just been rifling for drink money. So you must understand, sir, that all this is sheer joie de vivre, and as such, it's not punishable by law. Whereas your tendency towards violence is highly reprehensible and must be dealt with firmly. Why do you suppose the censor bans James Bond films and westerns and shows extraordinary leniency towards sex films on the assumption that if you make love, you won't make war. No harm is done to anyone, right? Yes, but that chap's getting away with my car, damn it. Oh, the fuss some people make. Recovery operations. Now and then, they search the lake bed and pull up a few borrowed cars or looted parking meters. The divers, who are all experts in this particular field, are all very young and blind. They feel perfectly at home down there 25 or 30 feet deep. Like fish who live in the depths of the ocean, they never miss their target. These Swedish boys and girls whom their provident society has restored to life and activity by giving them something worthwhile to do. Down, up, down, up. Guided by their sixth sense, it's only when they break the surface of the water that they probably feel momentarily lost. Down there on the lake bed, where they can dart about like fishes, they're masters of their environment. The dream of every Swede is to have two houses, a stuga outside town among the great fir trees and a flat in town. You can get a stuga without any trouble at all, but for the flat in town you must wait one, two or three years because the housing shortage in Stockholm is drastic. The ultra-modern city is filled with offices and the Swedes have preferred to leave the immediate city suburbs to live in the satellite towns 10 or 15 miles away. Not far from the center of Stockholm, there are a few hundred houses like this one, built in wood and rough cast, no more than two or three generations ago. Now they are condemned bungalows, where the rejects of the most prosperous social system in the world take refuge in the long, harsh winter nights. Homeless, shipwrecked humans, soaked in alcohol. When nothing better comes to hand, they'll even toss down a swig of antifreeze to get a kick from the few drops of alcohol in it. Others borrow sleeping space in parked cars. Still others sleep on the ground in parks, with only the snow for a mattress and a few old newspapers for blankets. In the morning, the street sweepers find them dead. In the country of prosperity and welfare, anyone has the right to freeze to death.
This household is being run as a cooperative. With not enough houses to go around, several young couples decided to make one home. A student with his wife who teaches art, a couple who are studying architecture, and there is a bachelor painter who minds the children while he gets on with his painting. The head of the family is a young professor of philosophy. They say everything works fine. In fact, they're enthusiastic about the experiment. Sharing the same set of household goods, of beds apart, is a great economic save. The children are never alone, and it promotes a greater sense of communication. Stimulating enough experience, though hardly a new one. The previous generation was often forced to share single flats by the war, and their memories aren't always so pleasant. The urge to communicate at a more intimate level has led Mrs. Asta Gustafsson, a journalist and writer, to found the Salome Club for married couples. The purpose of the club is the exchange of husbands and wives in the dark. Not in the sense that the lights are suddenly switched out, but because the rearrangement of the couples is done by a sort of housey-housey played with two packs of cards. Who's got the King of Spades? I have. The Queen of Hearts? Ah, nobody. Mrs. Gustafsson has had the good sense to exclude the lady from the packs. As soon as the new couples are formed, they go into a projection room to watch films, with titles we're not even allowed to mention. There is one cardinal rule for admission. Membership is only for couples, and one's partner must always be the same. Obviously a rule intended to avoid the embarrassment of new faces. <laughs> if the Salome Club is the tired face of Sweden, a society which has sacrificed so much to the paganism of physical life, here is the other, the brighter side of the coin. This too may be a pagan cult, but it is also the cult of physical beauty and the splendid harmony of nature.
wind in their hair. The joyous, invigorating caress of the chilled air on their naked bodies becomes a hymn to life, to the freedom and innocence of primeval time. small children what to do with them when you go shopping. In Sweden, however, the problem is more serious since 75 to 80 percent of Swedish women have jobs. So they've devised baby parking for children of all ages who are looked after at hourly rates by girls from a state institute. The baby parking schedule extends from one to seven hours and is run on exactly the same principle as the parking meters for motor cars. The amount of time the child spends with its parents between kindergarten and parking can add up to as little as two hours per day. So it's no wonder that some children leave home at 13 or 14. Many children left to their own devices like stray dogs turn into young delinquents. After a brief period spent in a center of psychological observation, the youngest are transferred to Barnbid, a garden village about 40 miles from Stockholm under the supervision of Dr. Jonsson. His method of spiel therapy is effective in an atmosphere where the children feel free to do anything they like when they like. This is the first time a camera has entered Barnbid. It is a model village of one central school building, a gymnasium and 13 bungalows in the grounds of a large park. Expenses are provided by the citizens of Stockholm. This 12-year-old girl was a prostitute. This little thief had been given up as hopeless. This angel faith was sent here because of the way she rebelled against her parents. And there is Gunil. She's 14. When she was 10, she gave herself to everyone in the neighborhood, the tradesmen, even strangers in the street. 
just to spite her parents, who are alcoholics. Now she is here, quiet and docile as a lamb at Barnbid, and she comes top of her class. At school, the children do what they want. They study, they read comics or play cards. Here, an attempt is made to align the children's mentality, cauterize the old wounds, and teach them self-respect and responsibility. The only way of finding out is by giving it a try. Seven or eight children live in each bungalow. They are a family-type nucleus, grouped around a family head, usually a psychiatrist, and a schoolmistress. In this way, the family structure is reproduced. This shop is probably the only one of its kind in the world. It advertises its wares with big placards denouncing the products it sells, wines and spirits. It is a system bolaget, a state shop authorized to sell alcoholic drinks. When an electronic device flicks on the red light at the cash desk, the person standing in front of it at the time is obliged to show his identity card to prove that he is not one of the 14,000 alcoholics in the state files of Sweden. If his name appears on the file, he is immediately asked to leave the premises. But outside the shop, there is usually some black marketeer ready to sell him aquavit at sky-high prices. Anyone can enter a restaurant and order a ham roll and a bottle of whiskey. You're not obliged to eat the roll. Any time will do for a drink as long as it is on closed premises. For instance, the public convenience where they pass the bottle over the metal division. should mind his own business. These drinking citizens were stung to protest when they realized they were being photographed.
These are the ones who couldn't care any more. They sit on the footpath with a slice of bread, spread with shoe polish. It contains a minimum quantity of alcohol. Or the gourmet, who take deep breathers from a petrol-soaked rag. Test your breath, sir. Blow into this bag, please, sir. The driver barely puffs into it, but it's no good. The crystals in the tube change color. The driver has been at the bottle, and it's no use protesting that he's been a confirmed teetotaler from birth, or that he's just been eating a liqueur chocolate. The charge is still rat filly drunk driving. It means a sentence of three months, in serious cases six, in Borgesund, a penal camp specially founded for alcoholic drivers, where you spend your time drinking milk and cutting logs for the state in return for a small weekly pay packet. <laughs> Swedish law is patient, however, and if a man is busy, he can choose his own time to come to the camp. After a cabinet meeting, for instance. After all, there's still plenty of tree trunks waiting for them in Bogasund. For chronic cases, there is the Karolinska Hospital with its alcohol clinic, where they push an antipas pill down your throat. For 48 hours afterwards, a glass of spirits tastes even less exciting than soda water. Though if anyone could actually face a drink after that pill, the chances are he would be knocked out when he had barely got through the first glass. All this drinking is a waste of time, and it's so bad for you when you're on drugs. Marijuana, hashish, morphine, opium, psychedelic pills, all of them. This house is just outside Stockholm, and the camera ended just as the seance was getting underway. There was a mild flutter of protest, and then complete indifference. Every day, the number of drug addicts goes up, a tragedy that threatens the most free, the most democratic, and the most prosperous. The Swedish police, who are usually so tolerant, are pitiless in cases like this. This is the future governing class, the class which needs to be trusted today. Whom else are we to look to for tomorrow?
why do you take drugs? I don't know. Because it feels good. We're happy. I wouldn't know. Nothing. Just, I wouldn't know. I don't know. A metal door that looks as stout as a bank vault, and inside a special sort of club for women only. The club is perfectly legal since in Sweden the idea of sex never seems to have any connotation with sin. So every kind of sexual recreation is permitted without the authorities finding anything to quarrel with. This club is a sort of bank vault, a sentiment. Here the most intimate secrets, the most unnatural tendencies of human nature are kept under lock and key. Which of these women is the young Eve we saw raped in the woods by the Knuta? For she is here, among this human wreckage whose long, long past and world-weary present is stamped on the masks of their faces. It is a frenzy to live without ever the hope of fulfillment in any positive direction. Oh, no, don't e ti sento arrivare sei a 300 metri 200 metri 100 metri Reina! Reina!
cento metri, due cento metri, cento, freno, freno, no, no! You're good, and you're kind, and you're clean. And you go around trying to help people, to warm their tepid hearts in this free, rich country of the future. Desperately unhappy, there's no let up. You clutch the telephone to your ear. It's as though all your strength, your whole life, were about to cave in. necessary for the girl to speak to somebody now without losing another second. For God's sake, help me. I have to talk to someone. I must. Sweden, with its well-trained air force, navy, and extremely efficient army, hasn't been to war for over 150 years. But the Swedes are quite prepared to face one with an atomic shelter. Other countries have atomic bombs, but the Swedes have the shelters. Naturally, it is constructed along Swedish lines, working at maximum efficiency, so that the Swedish race will be saved when the rest of the world is transformed into a vast ash pit.
down and down into the womb of the earth. Here, children are learning their lessons in survival. They will have to live underground a long time before they can emerge into the light in a world that has been smashed to atoms. They will have the strong, fresh roots of a chosen people destined to recreate the world. girls, 200 feet underground, are the women of the 21st century. They may well be the proud members of a race which will be mistress of the world of tomorrow. world of shadows in which the survivors will no longer recognize their own streets and houses. Petrified in body and soul, they will wait for the sun to rise on their world. And life will begin again from the beginning. And here in the islands of Stockholm, mankind will rediscover the smile of his lost innocence. The 30th of April, the last day of the long northern winter. Uppsala, freshmen in their first year at Sweden's greatest university. Their white caps are the symbol of their student status and they must solemnly promise never to take them off for 365 days. A deafening shout of joy swells through the university city. This night marks the beginning of spring, prelude to the brief golden summer of the north. Bonfires are lighted through the length and breadth of Sweden. The night of San Valpurga. Thank 
sun will rise on the dawn of spring a promise of happiness the statues the yellow gray sun the atomic shelter the dread of living in the long hours of solitude all seem a long way away from these boys and girls illusions in the first light of morning today may be no better or no different from the one before Life enters the streets, singing and dancing. Life with its hope, its love. Sweden and all its prosperity, freedom, hypocrisy, hope and fear belongs to you, to the boys and girls of Barnbid, the unknown girl dead in the truckyard, the old lady waiting for her daughter in the elephant's graveyard. <laughs> 